Hello, Internet. I, like a lot of people, uh, have been disturbed at recent events in Israel-Palestine, and I thought that I would lay out my thoughts uh, first in a document just to solidify them because a lot of the time uh, just organizing one's thoughts gets to be kind of, uh, it, it gets to be useful with current events. There's often research that goes into making sure that you understand something. Uh, there's often just collecting your thoughts in one place in text so that you can glance, uh, bring your eyes over it and just see uh, see the things that remind you why you think what you do and reflect on it and work on nuance, things like that. Or at least I geek out over, the, uh, over things like this. Maybe not everybody does, but, but I do. And sometimes when you build these things, you decide might as well share them because you, you, particularly if you get in the habit of writing and of thinking uh, and considering, you, you worry, uh, what if certain topics aren't adequately explored? What if certain arguments aren't explored well enough? And I have seen a whole lot of uh, stuff on the internet and elsewhere. Uh, jumping out to this conflict in ways where I don't think that they've really done a great job at considering everything. Either they're missing context, they're really trying hard to take uh, take a side that they already liked and liked before any of the specifics came up. And um, just because I'm making this in late 2023 uh, and videos take a while to, or uh, not take a while, they, they last a while, um, I'll recap very briefly the extremely recent events, but the, the conflict has been going on for a long time. So there was a uh, surprise attack uh, by uh, uh, Hamas forces um, across Israel. It was uh, concerted. It involved some kidnappings. It involved some uh, some bombings, uh, things like that. And it took the Israeli government by surprise. Uh, ordinarily, they try to um, try to keep up with what's coming up and prevent it. But this time they were caught off guard or, I mean, I guess in theory, if we're getting into uh, conspiracies that might not be totally insane, but seem a little out there, they might have let it happen. Um, I wouldn't put it entirely beyond the intelligence agencies to, uh, and even the political class there to do it. Um, but uh, but there, there, were, there were these attacks. They generated outrage across the world, particularly the kidnappings of uh, and lots of pictures of uh, families who lost a family member or who had somebody kidnapped. And it's led to a massive uh, assault in Gaza, where Hamas uh, has control. And it's lead the settler movements in the West Bank to go with even more impunity than they normally do, going after uh, Palestinian settlements. But they've been relatively free to do that for a long time if they don't go too far. But they've felt free to go a lot further than normal recently. And uh, with the death toll coming up from the IDF, the Israeli military, um, now at this point far surpassing the, the number of deaths caused by a Hamas's attack uh, and the level of visible misery in Gaza being incredibly high, it's led to a certain amount of wobbliness on the rest of the world in terms of uh, what is the IDF actually trying to do with this attack? Do they actually have a shot at doing anything useful? Uh, is this just to make a point? Um, and so in general, there's broad, there's broad support for Israel, but it's becoming nuanced as the situation drags on. And uh, the U.S. is offering uh, big military aid packages, which might or might not be necessary given that Israel is pretty advanced 
country economically and uh, it's not like Hamas is it's not like Russia invading it's not like they're going to lose the country unless it turns into a regional conflict which is a little unlikely because that would be a big can of worms and it would be incredibly economically disruptive but nobody really is entirely sure where, which way this is going to go and this has also created a lot of uh, mess around people and institutions all over the world taking sides, doing declarations for one side or the other. And that has led sometimes to employers uh, or would-be employers going after people who uh, have opinions that differ from whatever opinion their organization has decided to take. Generally, that's been a pro Israeli opinion, but occasionally it's gone the other way. Uh, and certainly throughout the um, Arab world and the Muslim world, which are not quite the same thing, but let's not get into that. Um, generally, things have, the sympathies have bent the other way, at least moderately. You, you read Al Jazeera and you're reading a very different set of stories than you are with a lot of Western hosted press, which generally tends to side more with uh, Israel on these things. And I, I'm bothered in general whenever you see institutions decide that they should have the ability to police the uh, opinions of their employees, whichever way. Uh, I, I think that it's a better society when people feel entirely comfortable working out what they think on these topics and expressing themselves on it and lobbying their governments uh, trying to and trying to persuade others towards their opinion um, like the there's free speech as culture concerns here um, like as I've probably expressed several times before I, I see free speech as being a lot more than just are you are you going to land in jail for what you say I think it's important to build a culture where workplaces don't go after employee speech and where potential employers don't go poking around trying to f figure out political views of their would-be employees. Uh, some of these things I think should be legally protected, but they're not, at least not in the United States. Uh, we actually have incredibly weak labor laws in the United States in general. And in the past, that's often worked just for the benefit of business owners, although more recently it's worked for the benefit on certain topics of uh, hardline progressives, although hardline progressives are also divided on this topic, um, which is helpful um, because ordinarily they get to push a lot of really bad ideas onto society without a lot of competition. For some reason, it's, it's uh, complicated, gets down to interpretations of existing laws that we have things being interpreted way more broadly than they were meant to. Um, ideas of preventing a hostile workplace environment get turned into only progressives are allowed to express opinions on certain things, which is frustrating for me as a liberal fellow traveler on the left with very different intuitions. Anyhow, circling back to the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, or maybe not circling back, jumping back, um, that's the that's the recent stuff like there, there's a gaza invasion that's going on right now um it's brutal uh, it's in response to a set of brutal attacks that are themselves in response to an endless chain of uh, abuse and misery and uh more broadly there's just a very messy history in the israeli-palestinian conflict and people often only learn part of one side of history. Uh, even though there are far more than two actors and there's a lot of atrocities to see all over the place from almost all the actors. And in judging these things, I think we should make some effort to be consistent in how we judge people and how we judge groups, rather than feeling any loyalty to one side and deciding they're the good guys, they get to do whatever they want. We should try and be aware of history but we should also be aware when it is just history, seeing things that are uh, further in the past 
than a certain point, however tragic they might be, as being no longer relevant, unless those events and figures are still being actively prized. And I, I know I judge my own country, the United States, considerably, uh, I would judge it much more harshly for slavery or the eradication of the Amerindians if these things weren't considered old shames. They are considered old shames. We don't, uh, at least we get, mostly don't venerate our founders and see them as flawless. Uh, there is unfortunately a hard right, ultra patriotic set of people who it seem really, uh, they have problems seeing any fault with the founders and I disagree with them very, very strongly. But the way that uh, I was taught and I'm in my mid forties, uh, the way that I was taught history included uh, the idea that our country has a lot of tragedies in its past, the United States. And it's important that we see these things as tragedies, as faults. Uh, and we try to do better on, on these things, or we mark these things as things never to be done again. We're ashamed of them, and we're not going to pretend they didn't happen, and we're not going to pretend they were okay. Uh, like, for example, if I were to step back in time and advise the Amerindians on how to deal with European explorers and colonists, kill every single one would probably be my advice. But that ship has long since sailed. It's too late. Uh, we don't have time travel. Uh, although the ethics of t around time travel uh, are uh, pretty, uh, we need to develop a new ethics for that if it were possible. But uh, I'm not part of the land acknowledgements crowd who do that kind of annoying, uh, this is on stolen land that was owned by the, this tribe of Amerindians or whatever. Uh, I don't do that. I, I think it's ridiculous. The, the, the ship there has sailed. Um, we can't fix that injustice, but the people who suffered it are all long dead. Um, and I don't think you can inherit injury. So uh, I, I, we, time eventually washes away those harms, provided that we have the decency to not be proud of the ugliest moments in history. I also think it's important that we be willing to blame all sides, uh, if, if justified. We don't need to pick a, a good side uh, and a bad side. But, and we have to be willing to allot blame unevenly, because it's, it would be lazy to just decide, well, both sides are bad, they're equally bad, end of story. Um, because that sounds very nice, but it's a cop-out. It's lazy. Um, it doesn't dig into specifics. Um, and it's important to dig into spe uh, specifics for these things. If you don't have specifics, then what do you have? You just have vague uh, moral gesture. And I think it's also important to distinguish civilians from governments, distingu uh, distinguish individuals from peoples, but recognize that conflicts rarely have these clean lines. So you may tell from the above, uh, all of the above, uh, given the topic, that I'm not a fan of either side in this con conflict. And that's correct. Israel is a relatively economically developed, deeply shitty theocra theocratic country built by terrorists that only recently has become kind of civilized, suppressing a would-be deeply shitty and dirt poor country or set of countries or people, whatever terms we use, full of theocratic terrorists. And by full of, I mean, there's a lot of them. It doesn't mean that everybody there is, or even most people are, but there's enough of them there that it's a problem. They fight each other. Neither side is deeply serious about a just peace. Uh, Palestinians fight each other too. Um, Israel has the luxury of being abusive through apartheid-style laws and gentle fascists in its right-wing governments uh, more, rather than overt acts of terror. There's an asymmetry in the conflict uh, that you, you get when you get to have a country. Both sides have such awful leadership that we might, and I often do, sometimes call them fascists. One of the example for Israel, finance minister, Besalel Smotrich. Further back, there's Rebbehem Zivi, who was assassinated. And I reiterate that I do not celebrate death, even for awful people. 
even for like uh, um, Gaddafi, but I do appreciate when sufficiently terrible people are no longer part of politics, which there, there had been, uh, that he had left politics earlier and more gently. But the distinction here is crucial. I'm not calling for death of people. Uh, I, I wouldn't. I don't, uh, even for the worst people, I'm not going to celebrate death. Uh, celebrating death is not something that civilized people should do. We're, we're, we're not trying to do that. Always use the, uh, the, the least brutal means possible. And uh, if, if you're doing something and if you're celebrating something, don't celebrate death. These people have families. They may be awful people, but they're, they're loved by people. They have mostly normal lives. They just have shitty morality. Hamas and the Palestinian Authority, for their part, have a long history of pocketing donations from other Arab countries that were meant to help poor, uh, dirt poor Palestinian citizens and using it for personal luxury. And there's the terrorism thing. They end up killing a whole lot of innocent people, uh, many people who they might even uh, might even sympathize with their side because they're, they're not going to be very precise with what they do. This doesn't mean Hamas should win or that the Palestinian Authority uh, are saints, or that its acts are justified. Rather, the point is that both sides do a lot of things that cannot be justified. And I'm not saying they're equivalent either, but I am saying that both sides are deeply, deeply shitty. And uh, the thing that got me started on this video is I want to lay out a few of the worst arguments that don't move me at all, that I think that should be just discarded, people should stop making them. And so some of them are wrong in very specific ways, and there might be a decent argument nearby, but some are nowhere near a good argument. And so I, I just want to put these out here and say, stop making these arguments, they're dumb. Uh, and they're, they're never going to be helpful. They're never going to, con they shouldn't convince anybody reasonable. Um, but here's a few of them. Uh, and actually I have 12. The first is, comes in two forms, because really they're close variants of each other. God gave us the land, or Mohammed threw a basketball hoop on the way to paradise after he died uh, somewhere in the area, or our most sacred places are there. And the answer to this is no, there aren't any gods. Mohammed uh, was just a person. When he died, he died. He didn't fly through the air to Palestine and do anything special. He just died. Making myths about this kind of shit is easy, but it's they're just myths. They, they, they don't justify anything. Uh, they're just cultural stuff, and, and that's it. They, uh, next. The end of times is supposed to have certain people in certain places, blah, blah, blah. And similar response, don't be ridiculous. Uh, th this is more religious nonsense. And th these myths, uh, they, they shouldn't be humored. They, they just bear no weight in mo modern intelligent conversation. Uh, grow up. Third, third argument, we were there in ancient times. Uh, and we could dig into the we and ask, uh, is, are you really the same we? Probably not. But also the scope of relevant history just doesn't extend that far back. And this is a general principle for parsing the morality of history. Sometime around 50 years, give or take, is the outer span of when we should consider past events to be morally relevant. Once you get past uh, a lifetime, uh, once you get past the lifetime of the average person, uh, you, you can't inherit guilt, you can't inherit uh, blame, you can't inherit a lot of those things. These things just fall off, they fade into history. Historical injustices cannot be corrected after a certain period of time. And uh, the same thing goes with any type of historical long, uh, long reaching, dig out the history books, we may have had this land at a certain point. It just doesn't matter. Like it, it, maybe that that was true, but it just doesn't matter. Fourth, your nation had a messy messy history too in its equivalent times. Let us do this, and we sometimes hear variants of the, uh, of this depending on phrasing. 
from either the Palestinian or the Israeli side as they seek to justify the atrocities that they did or want to do. And the answer to this is we're not going to give younger nations a pass this way in mo uh, modern times with modern international political norms. We're, we're trying to build modernity and we're not going to give younger nations atrocity credits. And besides, I'm willing to judge my nation too and say uh, things that were done in its founding are not things that I'm bound to approve of. And I, if I were around at the time, I may have I probably would have uh, strenuously objected or even fought against, uh, but the scope of relevant history doesn't extend that far back. Uh, we don't need to be standing on the back of a nation that we see as being justified from founding to the current day, and generally we're not. Most nations have tragedy in their past. doesn't mean that we should accept tragedy in the future if somebody wants to build a nation or recently did. Fifth argument, all nations are ethno-nationalist, therefore we should ignore the ethno-nationalist faults of nation. And here I, I keep coming across this, and I almost wouldn't bring it up except it keeps coming up. Unless you have a bizarrely broad understanding of ethnicity, this just isn't the case. Civic nationalism has replaced ethno-nationalism bit by bit in civilized countries over the last few centuries. It wasn't a sudden new dawn where uh, where like you had a whole bunch of laws and everything changed but nations have been improving and becoming less about a particular ethnicity uh, and more about who has the, the right legal history to, uh, to be here it's, and again it's been bumpy it's been gradual and there have been a few notable setbacks but that's where we've been moving. That's how we've been improving. And it's been part of eliminating a kind of racism that's been embedded in laws. The sixth argument that keeps coming up that I'm tired of is that population transfers are not genocide. And I adhere, we'll, we'll touch back upon a, the disclaimer that I offered above. How we define genocide is fair for discussion. Definitions generally are fair to quibble, quibble over, but that's a separate discussion. In my view, advocating population transfers in order to get the wrong people out of certain places fits one of the meanings of the term. And even if you prefer a separate term, that separate term inherits a lot of the stigma that genocide does. So you're not going to just pick a new term, get it over and have it uh, come out looking clean as, uh, or smelling clean as roses. It's not the way it works. Uh, po population transfers are a very ugly thing, whether we call them genocide, which I do, not the hardest form, not the most brutal form of genocide, but a form of genocide nonetheless, or if you don't, and if you prefer some other term, they're still very ugly things. Seventh argument that keep, keeps coming up, and this is really more one of the few that's more on, on one side, although there's a few, few uh, remaining, there's the idea that anti-Zionism is anti-Semitism. And I just consider this laughable. It keeps coming up and I am tired of it. Most ethnicities or peoples don't have states and a national project, even one that claims to represent an ethnic people is distinct from the people itself. It's possible to be anti-Zionist for anti-Semitic reasons, but it's also possible to be anti-Zionist for unrelated reasons. Uh, and so to to equate the two is a lazy and unacceptable smear to protect the national project. And one that, by the way, uh, it smears a lot of the anti-Zionist Jewish movements from the Neturai uh, Karta, which are very active here in New York City, to a number of liberal Jews, some of which live in Israel, some, uh, many of which do not. Um, and I might or might not have mentioned. Uh, I have some Jewish uh, ancestry myself. Uh, an Orthodox person would not consider me Jewish. Uh, it's, uh, I, I consider myself a bit Jewish in the way that I'm a bit Scottish, a bit French, a bit a lot of things. Um, but uh, I know a whole bunch of people who the Orthodox would consider Jewish who are uh, fiercely anti-Zionist. And calling them anti-Semitic is just ridiculous. 
you, you might, again, rightly criticize certain anti-Zionists as anti-Semitic, but, uh, but to equate the two is nonsense and it's unacceptable. Eighth, uh, eighth thing that keeps coming up is Palestinians are the victims. Whatever they do is justified in the name of throwing off the oppressor. And I'll note, victims today are often oppressors tomorrow if they get lucky enough to get enough power. More concretely, a violence that doesn't visibly yearn for a just peace is not a potentially justified violence. And minimizing impact to the less culpable is a moral necessity for whatever theories of culpability one brings to the table, all but the most unnuanced people have gradations here. So I, you, nobody gets a blank check just because they're a victim. It, uh, this, this idea, and this is often a particularly certain flavors of progressives like to make this argument. And uh, it's, just, it's a very weird argument, uh, but I guess that the hardliners of that flavor of progressive tend to see victimhood as really giving you that blank check. It's the same people who say that uh, like black people can't be racist. Uh, it's like, what, what weird definitions are you playing with? Uh, ninth argument, which is uh, one of the, the rare that's uh, not really tied to either. Uh, ninth argument uh, that I'm tired of hearing is this is all the fault of the British because of the mandate. And I, this is uh, another, uh, this is uh, often done by the same people who really would like to say, let's just a lot blame equally on both sides because it makes us look cool. Um, uh, and, but here it's saying, let's just blame the British because it's easy to blame the British. Everybody knows that the British were bad. And I, I think this is, it's the same argument people make, uh, make that the backwards homophobic laws throughout much of Africa are not the fault of the Af uh, African societies there. Uh, and I would just say that the possible blame for shitty social values and uh, shitty laws, particularly in countries that vote, falls pretty quickly once the people have self-determination. Give them a decade or two and it's essentially the, the hands are washed. Uh, you can't blame the British anymore uh, for those particular things. Now, you, there's a lot that you can blame British colonialism for, uh, and I'm not justifying the British mandate, although we can scoot back even further uh, if we really want to hardline blame, blame the British and see if we can blame the Ottoman Empire as well. But uh, no, I, it just doesn't make sense. At this point, this is owned by the Israelis and the Palestinians and uh, the way that they vote uh, or the people that they support, the movements they, uh, they form, uh, it's theirs. It isn't the British. The tenth argument uh, that I'm tired of hearing is that the Arabs left voluntarily as Israel was founded. And here we'll loop a little bit back into one of the spicier things I said in the intro. I'd say look at uh, Irgun, look at Leahy, look at the other early Jewish terrorist groups that did massacres in the run-up and in the early days of, the, um, of, uh, of Israel. Uh, Actually, the, the, the Sterngang, the person who founded that, uh, he called himself a terrorist. He wrote a manifesto advocating terrorism uh, as a way to establish the Jewish, uh, Jewish state. He was proud of it. Uh, and uh, he actually, the IDF has a medal named after him, honoring him. So uh, yeah, they, they, this, this argument just historically doesn't, doesn't work. 11th argument that I'm tired of hearing is that uh, Arabs or Jews have an obligation to disclaim what I think they might believe, or I think that they should be treated like shit, confronted, or face violence worldwide. And I'd say no, nobody has an obligation to share their views with you on any topic. And you're the jerk if you try and press an obligation to them or treat them ill for not sharing their views. They might not have views. They might have views, but they might just be trying to get through the day. Assuming what people believe based on their ethnicity or putting special obligations of whatever kind based on that is not acceptable in modern times. Uh, we've, we've seen attacks on Arabs and attacks on Jews all over the world from this conflict. It shouldn't happen. 
uh, it's awful. Uh, it just makes absolutely no sense outside of uh, Israel-Palestine. Stop it. And finally, let's just end on a 12th argument that I've also heard, uh, that all Palestinians or Israelis are bad people. And I think such generalizations are ridiculous. The strongest form of this dumb idea is to imagine a newborn of either. There's no chance either of them has had the, uh, has had the time to pick up any kind of guilt yet. They're a newborn. You couldn't even tell them apart because ethnically, they're pretty much the same people. So if not then, when does this imagined guilt slip in? And how can we actually claim that it always does? You know, I think we, we have to abandon this argument. Uh, I've heard the, the one spitting on Palestinians from far-right politicians in the US, but uh, it's ridiculous with either of them. Uh, there are, the majority of Palestinians and Israelis are decent people, perhaps with bad politics, but they're not bad people. So to bridge that last point back onto broad topics, while I'm deeply frustrated with both sides and dismissive of the supposed uh, unique, deep, magical virtues of either side, these are talking about them as political social groups. Um, as individuals, particularly if you don't talk about these topics, they're usually normal, fine people trying to live normal lives and dealing with reality sucking around them. They're scared of the other, sometimes arrogant about what they think they deserve, and many of them have stupid religion clouding their mind. This leads to bad politics, but it's very human, and this is the kind of shit that has plagued humanity since before we were human. There's nothing special about this hatred, nothing noble about it, and no special meaning in the suffering except groups of humans struggling with their nature and how they relate to other groups of humans. Tragedies like this have played out countless times over the past hundred thousand years. And so the obvious question comes about after somebody has talked for this long, what would I do in either side's shoes? The answer is really, I don't know. Uh, it's a messy, nasty problem. And I don't, I don't know if uh, you're ever gonna have somebody coming up with an idea that's going to shake the world and redefine everything and suddenly cause sharp edges to resolve into smooth ones. It'll take work. What, whatever uh, happens, if, if we want a good outcome, it'll take a lot of work. Uh, there'll be stumbles along the way. Uh, it won't be pretty. There will be more messes like this. And there'll be more daily horrible abuses like uh, those the Israeli government has done. Uh, more slaughters from their settler movement. There'll be more terrorist attacks from Palestinians. And there'll be more stupid stuff handling elsewhere in the world as people don't get that uh, that Jewish people are, uh, across the world have many of many have nothing to do with Israel, and uh, Arab people across the world many of them have nothing to do with Palestine. Um, so, what would I do in either side shoes? I would I I don't know, but I would start with a few things. Going from the I'm sure this is necessary whatever the path to peace looks like, towards specific ideas that are not the only plan or idea that could possibly work. So here I have uh, five things. First is there, we need to build a yearning for peace uh, and a yearning pe for peace that will be undulled by events that have happened and that will happen. This is necessary. It's important to learn to ignore uh, the people who are always hungry to say after some event, enough is enough, the gloves are off forever. Ideally, we should actually hate those people the most, hate them more than the other side. Um, point B, there needs to be a commitment to stop electing people who want to do ethnic cleansing or population transfers if that somehow doesn't fit your definition, to take that off the table forever. Uh, I named two culprits. Uh, I, I named the current finance minister uh, of Israel, who is a fascist. Uh, I named uh, Zivi uh, up above, who was a fascist. Uh, and Israel keeps electing these terrible uh, fascists into government. Uh, and that needs to be taken off the table. And Palestinians likewise need to give up on this idea of ethnic cleansing. If you can't do that, then you're never going to 
even possibly be able to build trust. Uh, so push those people out to the margins. Now that's not a lot to give up. It doesn't even prevent violence. It doesn't prevent letting off steam. It doesn't prevent the asymmetric fighting. But, but there needs to be a notion that at the end of the day, a hundred years from now, two hundred years from now, there will there will be people if is uh, uh, there will be Israelis and Palestinians, whether they're uh, nationals of the same place or not, they'll they'll be there. C, and this is something where I, I where it's a little less certain, but I think it, it actually for any anything that I would consider just, there needs to be a, a giving up on ethno nationalism. Uh, and giving up on the idea of telling people who are not in the country now that they get a fast track to citizenship based on some notion of family or based on some effort to, com uh, to combat demographic, uh, demographic shifts. So no law of return, no right of return. Uh, they both need to be buried forever. And they need to get rid of the idea that the state is about or for one people or uh, over another. There need to be firm non-discrimination provisions in the state, and this does mean an end to birthright programs and special loans. Uh, they need to reinstate Arabic as another national language. And generally, they need to repeal the 2018 nation-state bill, which set Israel on a very dark path. Uh, that's something that Israel needs to do, but both sides need to give up on ethno-nationalism. Uh, D. Uh, the settler movement needs to end entirely, uproot all their settlements in the West Bank, every single one, and prosecute all the crimes that they've done. No amnesty, nothing. After a transitional period of maybe 10 or 20 years, more open land ownership should be permitted, but there needs to be a cooling off period. And finally, adopting a constitution, a real constitution to protect core tenets uh, like non-discrimination, having good civil protections, uh, from concerns over demographics, that is something which takes some of the pressure off of the demographic war that's in the background of all of this. So those are my broad thoughts on, uh, on the topic. Uh, there's a lot of specific arguments that can and should be entertained. There's a lot of, uh, there's a lot of history there. There's a whole lot of abuse there. We, we could dig deep into Israeli law, we could dig deep into uh, what the Palestinians have done. Um, and again, I'm not suggesting moral equivalence, anything like that, but I do have a lot of frustration with both sides, and I think that that's healthy. I'm not going to take uh, generally either side. Um, I, I'm just not interested in that. Neither side gets a blank check or anything even remotely resembling uh, it. Uh, I'm, neither side needs to sit back whenever there's uh, violence and accept it. Uh, neither side needs to sit back whenever there's some other kind of abuse and accept it. But there needs to be a yearning for peace. There need, needs to be work to build the conditions that would permit peace to come about. And that's hard. And, it, uh, and actually building a lasting just peace would take work from both sides. It would uh, take not having extremists of either side assassinate whoever's uh, trying to do it. Um, it, uh, it, it. It would be messy, but it needs to happen or we're going to have this conflict dragging on for a very, very long time. Anyhow, those are my thoughts on the conflict. Um, hopefully I've, uh, I, I imagine that uh, unless uh, somebody is likewise not inclined to really take either side, uh, at least entirely, they, they might find this expression frustrating, but I'm no stranger to that. If you're going to think through issues honestly and carefully, then hopefully you're willing to uh, accept it you're going to frustrate some people. Anyhow, that's what I've got on this topic. Bye-bye.